Hey traders, Mike Sir here. In my past videos, I profiled some rogue traders like Nick Leeson, who lost $1.3 billion and led to the collapse of a bank, and a drunk trader who lost $10 million of a firm's capital. While these losses are minuscule compared to a story of a Canadian trader who lost over $6 billion of his hedge fund's money and led to its collapse. So in this video, I'm going to share with you the downfall of this trader named Brian Hunter, who at one point was considered a rock star trader due to the billions of dollars of profits he was generating for a hedge fund. So let's get started. Brian Hunter is a fellow Canadian energy trader and once considered one of the most successful traders in the world. A self-described numbers guy with a master's degree in mathematics, he excelled in trading specifically in the natural gas markets. Now Brian started his career at Calgary-based TransCanada Corp as a junior analyst in developing ways to profit from anomalies in energy prices. Four years later, he moved to New York to join Deutsche Bank in May 2001. He had a natural talent for the energy markets and helped make over $69 million for the bank in its first two years there. By 2003, Brian was promoted to head of Deutsche Bank's natural gas desk. But in December of that year, Brian and his team lost over $50 million in a single week, betting that natural gas prices would fall. They didn't foresee the unprecedented run-up in gas prices, but it gave an early indication of Brian's excessive risky trading style. Now, as a result of his bad bets, Brian actually got demoted to an analyst position and soon after left the firm. However, he wouldn't leave quietly as he sued the bank over a withheld bonus in which he claimed to have made over $40 million in overall profits for the bank despite the big losses. However, Deutsche Bank denied the allegations and Brian never got his bonus. It seemed like Brian's Wall Street career was over, but in April 2004, Amaranth Advisors, a multi-strategy hedge fund, came calling. They were looking to expand its energy trading business at a time when the whole industry was taking off, and experienced traders like Brian were very scarce and in high demand. Brian was attracted to this opportunity was because he had the opportunity to move back to his hometown of Calgary, and since 20% of the natural gas used in the US came from his province of Alberta, Canada, Amaranth also wanted to build a physical presence in Calgary. For a few years, life at Amaranth was very, very good for Brian, but it was in 2005 when Brian made his mark in the company. In fact, Brian made a huge bet that natural gas prices would go up, and then when two major hurricanes struck in the US, prices skyrocketed due to the huge disruption in supply. Here's a chart of natural gas prices, and you can see right here at the beginning of 2005, when natural gas prices were a little bit above $6. And then particularly after Hurricane Katrina hit in late August, gas prices skyrocketed to over $16. These energy trades in fact helped Amaranth achieve a return of 21% in 2005, almost all of which came from energy trades. In total, Brian made the fund more than $1 billion in profits in 2005, and as a reward, Brian received a $100 million plus payday. Prior to his big score, Brian was a controversial figure in the world of natural gas trading, as he had a reputation as an extraordinary aggressive trader. He thinks he's bigger than the market was a common response from other energy traders when asked about Brian's trading style. And in some ways, they weren't wrong about Brian. According to some reports in early 2006, Amaranth's position accounted for 60 to 70% of the open interest in futures contracts for the falling winter in natural gas. In fact, many natural gas traders were reluctant to take positions opposite Amaranth, regardless of their view on market fundamentals, due to Brian and his team's ability to affect natural gas prices through their large trades. In fact, Brian's billion dollar score should have been a clear sign that he was taking a crazy amount of risk, and in 2006, this sort of risk-taking finally caught up with him. Before I share the details of the trade, please take a moment to like this video. I would really appreciate your support. Okay, let's get back to the story. In 2006, 
Brian's analysis led him to believe that natural gas prices could be higher during the winter season compared to prices in the summer and fall season. Now, this was a perfectly reasonable thesis because natural gas prices tend to fluctuate based on seasonality. Since temperatures are usually more moderate from spring to fall, fewer people rely on natural gas to heat their homes during these times relative to the cold winter season when there is higher demand. In turn, lower usage would cause market prices to fall during the spring to fall season and spike in the winter season. To take advantage of this seasonal trend, Brian employed a simple trading strategy that involved buying natural gas futures contracts that would be delivered in the winter and betting prices would go up by the winter season while also shorting natural gas futures contracts that would be delivered in the fall and betting prices would reach the lowest levels before the fall season. But overall, he was net long in believing that natural gas prices would skyrocket like in previous years where there could be another devastating hurricane season. In fact, this strategy was so effective that by April 2006, Brian was up nearly $2 billion in profits and single-handedly accounted for almost all of Amrit's profits for the year. But by the beginning of May, things started to change. Gas prices stopped going up and started falling down to about $6 per BTU. Natural gas producers were pumping up as much gas as they possibly could at these high price levels and actually would end up being the single largest buildup of pre-winter natural gas inventory in history. However, Brian wasn't concerned and remained committed to his bet that prices would rise based on a repeat of the previous year's destructive weather. He continued to add to his natural gas positions and extended his futures positions out several years, believing that natural gas prices wouldn't stay at these low price levels for too long. At this point in time, he held more than 100,000 futures contracts, a number that constituted nearly 40% of the total outstanding natural gas futures contracts on the exchange. If there was another weather disaster, he would make a fortune. Unfortunately, prices continued falling and Brian's natural gas positions were now down more than $1 billion, four times more than what he was willing to lose. Now, Brian was told to sell off some of his losing positions by the firm, but he couldn't. Everyone in the industry knew exactly what position he was in, and if he sold, it would actually further drive down prices even more. So he did what many gamblers do. He doubled down, meaning he kept adding more to his positions at lower prices, thus bringing his average cost price lower and helping to support the market. His only hope of this big mess was that weather conditions would get worse. Unfortunately, they didn't. And by September of that year, natural gas prices sunk to their lowest level in four years and Brian's fund had run out of money to pledge as margin for his futures positions. His margin requirements, which is the amount of cash required to back its futures contracts positions, skyrocketed to $3 billion. Brian had no choice but to begin unloading some of his positions to raise cash. As a result, on September 14th, his firm Amaranth posted its single worst day ever, losing in excess of $560 million when gas prices fell below $5.50. It didn't get better the next day as prices continued to fall, hitting a new low of $4.35. Amaranth's net assets were now down to $3.5 billion and the firm tried desperately to raise capital to stay afloat to no avail. Sensing blood in the water, JP Morgan, which had served as the source of financing for Amrit's margin deposits, called Amrit and offered them a deal. They, along with Citadel, another hedge fund, would buy out Amrit's natural gas positions for $2.5 billion. Amrit, with no better option, accepted the deal. Whether it was sheer bad luck for Brian and Amrit, but shortly after the sale, natural gas prices hit their bottom and skyrocketed rising over 80% in a matter of two months has per Brian's thesis of higher natural gas prices by the winter season. Now it was later reported that both JP Morgan and Citadel made a fortune on Brian's positions, making a profit of over $1 billion each. As well, over $4.5 billion was made collectively by other energy traders on the natural gas price recovery in 2006. Amaranth, on the other hand, ended up posting a $6.6 .6 billion loss and was forced to dissolve entirely. 
So let me quickly summarize the $6 billion loss for you. So here's a chart of natural gas, and you can see that prices started falling in late 2005 and plummeted in early 2006. Now this was when Brian started building his positions in natural gas. You can see that this is where Brian's fund was almost up $2 billion in profits. This was when gas prices started going down and Brian was down $1 billion. This was a point where Amareth reported a $560 million loss. This was when Amareth sold their natural gas positions for $2.5 billion. And you can see here, prices rose over 80% from its lows and many gas traders made billions except Amareth. Following Amareth's collapse, Brian was immediately accused of violating anti-manipulation rules by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission stemming from his trading in February and April of 2006. He was initially fined $30 million for manipulating natural gas prices, but the amount was later reduced to $750,000. Now, despite his blow up at both Deutsche Bank and Amareth, there are a few lessons that you can learn from Brian. First lesson is you need to treat trading and analysis as two separate skills. Now, despite Brian's setbacks, he has always excelled in his natural gas price forecasts and analysis. Now, after an allegations of manipulation prevented him from starting his own fund, he found work as a consultant devising trading models and strategies for a fund called Peak Ridge Capital Group. Now, Brian would later reveal that he never enjoyed the trading aspect, but liked designing the trading models and doing the analysis. Peak Ridge's fund has done well and has been up over 200% since its founding. Now, this is a perfect example of a top analyst trying to be a top trader. Second lesson is you gotta know what you're getting into before you trade. Now Brian says that huge price swings are quite common in natural gas trading, so any trader in that market has to be comfortable with the volatility. If you want stability, the natural gas market might not be for you. In addition, Brian traded this highly volatile market with leverage futures contracts, which gave him huge buying power in the billions of dollars. So it's not really a surprise that Brian had two major setbacks because quite frankly, he was playing with fire. When he won, he won big. But when he lost, he would characterize the losses as just a give back of profits that he had made earlier. Now many people think of Brian as a big time gambler, but I personally think that he knew what he was doing. He was just comfortable with taking these risks. The third lesson is you gotta learn to play big. Now, how many traders out there can claim a hundred million dollars payday in one year or even in their entire trading career? Now, not many, but Brian can. Now, despite his blowups, he's a very, very rich man. And the only way that he had accomplished that was playing with big positions. Now, obviously I'm not here to tell you to be like Brian and just go all in, in your trades, but size was a key ingredient to Brian's trading strategy. When he had a conviction of a trade idea and he's done his research, he feels that large and concentrated positions could drive the market and he wouldn't be phased by their temporary losing positions. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and want to watch other videos, please click on the left for more videos like this and click on the right for the full playlist. I'll see you on the next video.